Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, anyone not speak English? Okay, we're all good. <laughs> all right, my name's Chris. So I've been invited to speak here today as the first speaker. Yeah, I'm going to cover a few things. Firstly, before I start, I want to just pulse the crowd. So who here is like, what's the matrix? Everybody? Yeah, who hasn't watched the matrix? Okay. Who hasn't watched like the Terminator series? Okay, mostly the, the ladies. Okay, who, who hasn't watched Ex Machina? Quite a few. Um, what's another one? Who hasn't watched The Circle yet? Quite a few, yeah. Okay, so, so this event is, is inspired by Black Mirror. So who is watching Black Mirror? Quite a few. Who hasn't got a Netflix account yet? Okay, nobody. Okay, we'll go a little bit deeper. So who's heard of Neuralink? Okay, we'll, we'll start a little bit higher. Who's heard of Elon Musk? Who's heard of what he's doing with Neuralink? Nobody's read up on Neuralink? Who knows what I'm talking about when I say uh, BMI? Brain machine interfaces. No? Okay, who, who reads? Who's heard of Tim Urban? Tim Urban. From Wait But Why? Shit, too, many, too few people. Okay, so his latest post is on Neuralink. It's a really long read. It takes like all weekend to read it. It's literally a book. But it's an amazing read. It'll really enlighten you as to the future and what some people are thinking about this future. Okay, so I've got a good pulse of the crowd. I'm going to just take it as I go. My presentations can sometimes, it's the red pill or the blue pill. We never know where we're going to get. <laughs> but in the, I'll be talking about sort of what's wrong in the industry today. And then I'll be presenting you um, really bringing a gift. And that's the model I've created over the last couple of years. It's free for everybody. And, and then we'll finish off with what's happening with Facebook. What's happening with their feed? And why is Facebook having to adapt and change as they have passed now the 2 billion um, active users per month barrier? So who's, who remembers this? 1997. Steve Jobs came back to Apple. It was months away from bankruptcy. And he launched this campaign, a media campaign, communication campaign, the Think Different campaign. It was about the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the ones that pushed the human race forward. We read books about them, we made movies about them, they inspired us, we even let them lead us. But don't be fooled, these crazy ones, they're all around us, maybe even in this room. You know, as we move from a world of products to services, we're going to need you to think different. As we, we move from a world of ownership to access, we're going to need you to think different. And as we move from a world of scarcity into a world of abundance, we're going to need you to think different. Because you see, that's what technology does. It turns scarcity into abundance. So for the next 20 minutes or so, we'll follow in the footsteps of David Bowie. He spoke to us from his grave. He was quite the entrepreneur. He launched one of the first ISPs back in the early 90s, before anyone knew what the internet was. And he was famous for this quote, the future belongs to those who hear it coming, because you see the future hasn't been written yet, but you can listen to it. It's whispering to us. It's already here really, but it's just uneven and distributed. If you go to China, for example, countries that are quite a bit ahead when it comes to the internet and social media, then you can see what our future might look like. So why do we get this point to this point? 20 years after Steve Jobs came back to Apple, 10 years after the iPhone was launched in 2007, which is really why we're standing here all today. Social media is basically built on the back end of these mobile phones. Why do we get to this point where last year, the COO of Adblock Plus stands up on stage at Savage Marketing and presents this slide. We messed up, we lost track of user experience. It's a, it's a message supported by the ERB. It's because of this. The best minds of our generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click more ads. You know, while Elon Musk is reinventing mobility with Tesla, SpaceX, Hyperloop, the boring company, 
and reinventing energy with solar cities, gigafactories, and even reinventing what it means to be human with Neuralink, trying to connect our brains to the internet, make us smarter. The best minds of our generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click more ads. This quote comes from an ex-Facebook employee. I forget his name, Hammerbacker, I think. And he went on to now use AI to try and fight cancer. So that's what he's busy with right now. But in a mobile environment, the only ads people want to see are the ads they would miss if they were not there. This quote comes from Seth Godin. Who here has heard of Seth Godin? Too few people. He's, re he's written 19 books. Who's read The Purple Cow? Oh, three, four. So a little tip. You go to audible.com. It's an Amazon company. The first book's free. So you can just download The Purple Cow. It takes about four hours to listen to while you're in the car or at the gym. It's an amazing book. It's a book about how to be remarkable in today's noisy era. How to be remarkable and talk to people that care. It's very relevant now with innovation. How to innovate in ways that add value to people's lives and how to reach them and communicate that value to them. Who knows who this is? It's social media, right? Has anyone heard of Gary Vaynerchuk? Yes, some people follow him. I don't follow him anymore. He actually achieved his goal with me. I followed him for two years and then I ended up leaving. But that's his goal for you to leave, right? And he day trades attention. But when you get a thousand people day trading attention on Facebook, attention's our most valuable asset. And that we're in an attention economy. Attention is the asset now. When you have people manipulating us in the way that we spend <coughs> our time and give our attention, things start to go wrong. And that's what I'll be talking to you a little bit about as we go through the presentation. Because ultimately, marketers ruin everything. Because that's what we do. We exploit wants for profit. That's what marketers do. We turn needs into wants. That's marketing. And for that, we need attention. That's advertising. Before you can tell your message, you need someone's attention. But in a hyper-connected world, attention becomes the asset because you can reach people now. The marketers of today will become the spammers of tomorrow if you let them. That one's mine. <laughs> but seriously, if you ask Google the definition of a spammer, a person or organization that sends irrelevant or unsolicited messages over the internet. It's what a lot of us are still doing. Maybe not so much in this room, but a large majority of the companies on this planet are still doing it that way. So by definition, they are spammers. It's this. It's the TV industrial complex. You see, you've got to understand that radio, outdoor advertising, newspapers, uh, television, these were all mediums invented by advertisers and marketers to focus attention, the asset. Bring people in, focus their attention, so that I have a medium now to deliver a message, to do my marketing, to turn their needs into wants. Where it goes awfully wrong is where you start marketing to wants, where there's no need in the first place. So that's, where, that's the, the, uh, the industry we've got into. But it's, it's about this. It's, it's about buying an ad, getting extra distribution, selling more products, making a profit to build bigger factories. That's the industrial revolution when media came along. But it doesn't work today because the user's empowered because we have ad blockers to block these ads. And this is a, a, a graph from Mary Mika's report last year. It comes out every July. Look out for it this year. It's, uh, it was 355 pages, but there was one slide here. And that showed the development of ad blockers in today's society. It is worldwide, and the green line is mobile, the red line is desktop. And this is how many people actually have active ad blockers on their devices. And look at the trends of these things. And this was one and a half years ago when this data came out. This isn't about to stop. And Google knows this. So what's Google doing? As always, they try and disrupt themselves before someone else does it. One of Gary Vaynerchuk's famous quotes. Disrupt yourself before someone else does it because it's much better to put yourself out of business than to have someone else do it for you. So they're building in an ad blocker into Chrome. Probably turned on by default. And this ad blocker is not just going to block ads, but it's probably in time going to block everything, trackers, whatever you want it to block. And that's because they know that it, the consumer is going to get a hold of an ad blocker. It may as well come from Google. Then they know what you're blocking at least. <laughs> <laughs> so... It comes down to this with everything in life. It's about evolving. It's about adapting. It's about letting go of the old. It's about adapting the new. But the challenge isn't adapting the new. We all want new stuff. We can all do new stuff. It, the challenge is actually getting rid of the old, 
getting rid of all the shit that's happened yesterday to make room today for the innovations of tomorrow. That's the big challenge. And right now for organizations, it's about transforming and adapting through this little thing that we all carry in our pockets, where the consumer is spending their attention. Because if a company can't communicate through this, then they will be made irrelevant in time as the consumer adopts these devices. So it comes down to this. This is the core of what I talk about all the time, is that we're in an era now where technology is abundant. It's all around us. We're connecting with it. And now we're trying to build relationships through this thing, whatever it is, these devices, this software. We're trying to build relationships through technology. But what happens when you connect two mobile phones with the internet in between and you have two people behaving on these things? Well, the only way to understand how the relationship between these two points is through the data that's being generated when devices connect to each other. The bits and bytes, the data, that is a conduit into human behavior, into how people are feeling, the relationships they're having with each other, with brands, with devices, with information. Uh, is there love? Is there hate? Are they doing the things I need them to be doing? Are they doing the things that they need to be doing for me to stay in business? So it's all in the data. And we suck at extracting those in, that information from data. We, we spend all our days in Excel sheets and databases. And that's why AI is coming in, is it's much more efficient at extracting value from data. But this revolution is highly invisible. You know, I'm not seeing technology when I'm looking at you. It's in your pockets. And soon it's going to be built into all of the stuff we have around us. It's the smartification of our world. It's an invisible revolution facilitating the mobility of human experience. This is the slide from Microsoft. And, and some of these devices that we're all adopting into our homes already, we know them. It's the thermostats, it's the phones, it's the smart TVs. These are cutting edge brands that understand that if I can put technology into someone's life, I can start to understand how they're living their life. I can start to understand how they're behaving. And I, I've got now a channel to reach them and measure their behavior. And you've got to do that in responsible ways because if you don't, this starts to happen. Because marketers, remember, ruin everything. Exploit once for profit. <laughs> And if we don't sort of give them rules and guidelines and try to get them to understand what they're doing in the long run, then this sort of starts to happen. So technology grows exponentially. It can, it's binary, but we don't. Human beings have taken millions of years to evolve. Technology does it in a matter of hours, days, and months. It can, it's binary, it's exponential. On the one side, you have innovation. That's these brands coming in, putting cool technologies into our lives, and trying to empower us, trying to save us time. That's what most of these things do. But on the other side, it's about adaptation. As an individual, how do I adapt with all this technology I have in my life? How do I adapt to using my mobile phone in ways that are gonna add value to my life instead of take away my time and attention? How do I, as an organization, how do I adapt? How do I adapt to communicate with a consumer that's always shifting and using different technology? And connecting with digital in so many different touch points. How do I have a coherent message across all of those touch points? Build a relationship with them, pull them in. It's only the beginning. It's a plumbing phase. We're still trying to connect all this stuff up together. It's not working very well. But slowly but surely we adopt, we adapt. It starts with our mobile phone. That's at the center. And we connect. And we, it's either in or it's out. But the internet is growing. Digital is growing. Technology is growing. So we're slowly adopting this. We're trying to go back to the way it used to be, a conversation like I'm having now with you. We're conversational creatures. We're trying to take technology out. Technology has been quite dumb up to now, but it's becoming smarter and smarter. And we're going to start to converse. We're doing it already. Most of our time spent in Messenger. We're connecting. We're, we're having conversations in these mediums. And that's Facebook knows that too. That's why they've been buying up all these Messenger platforms. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. These mediums are powered by virtual assistants. From Siri, we all know Siri, it's quite dumb, it's the dumbest up till now. Microsoft, Cortana, Alexa, the one to rule them all. From Amazon and the Google Assistant, they didn't give their assistant a name because you already have a relationship with Google. We don't need more relationships. The Dunbar number, who's heard of the Dunbar number? It's how they build uh, military um, operations. 150 meaningful relationships is all we can handle as human beings. When it starts to increase above that number, then those connections start to lose meaning. You start to, and, and that's what happens when you're hyper-connected. We're in our social media trying to manage hundreds of relationships on Instagram and Facebook, LinkedIn, 
it starts to break down because even in our organizations, you know, we, a lot of them are above 100 people. You know, my organization is about 110 people and I'm having a lot of trouble remembering all the names and remembering all the conversations I'm having because I've got also the hundreds of relationships I'm trying to have online. So it breaks down. Google understands that. They understand that we don't need more relationships. The other ones have all given them name. That poses a new problem. It's a new relationship I need to have. But these digital assistants are meant to empower us and help us use all the wonders of digital. Bring us the apps that we need and the solutions that we need to solve our problems because most of the apps that you have are just solving a problem for you. So we get to this point, meaningful connections. It's a model I built early last year. Fits in really nicely with the new um, meaningful social interactions from Facebook, which is coming up after this. But it re really, I just started to build it because I started to ask questions to my agency. You know, why would a company go online? And to my amazement, nobody could answer that question. Why would a company build a website? And the answer is really simple, is that they want to connect with more people. They want to reach more people. They want to build more relationships. They want to pull people into the value that they're offering. So on the one side, you have the security. And on the other side, you have the privacy. Meaningful connections, meaningful relationships. On the one side, it's the technology that when, if you give data to it, one of the key criteria is that that data is being kept safe, that it doesn't get into the wrong hands. But on this side, if I'm going to give you, if I'm going to give into the relationship and share some of my personal things with you, and you're tapping into my privacy, into who I am, so there also, there's a, there's, a, there's a rule there. You know, if I'm going to give you something, then you better keep it safe and use it in the right way because otherwise I'm going to stop giving it to you. But if I don't give it to you in the first place and I don't end the relationship, then I'm not going to get all the value that you have to offer me. That's meaningful connections. On the one side, you have the World Wide Web, a linked devices that generate data. The whole thing in one sentence. Why IoT? Because that's just a lot of devices. Internet of Things is just a lot of things connected to the internet. Why IOE, which is the next version of it? That's when everything, we are perpetually connected to it, the internet of everything. And why big data? Because there's a lot of it. And when you can connect it in meaningful ways, you can draw insights from that data, which helps you to make better decisions, drive actions within a company, for example. And how some of these companies got in really early on this game. Google, for example, one of the first ones, they understood that information defines who we are in the end. The information we're exposed to defines who we are, defines our worldviews. It's one of the critical elements of drawing meaning out of life. So they collected and organized the world's information and made it universally accessible and useful. It's still their mission statement today. They put up a search bar, they put the whole world behind it, and they let us go there and tell them what we wanted. We ask questions. We tell them what we want. Remember I said marketing is turning needs into wants. Well, the holy grail of marketing is actually just asking what somebody wants and answering the question. Now you know the intent of that person in that second and you can deliver a beautiful appetizer, a meaningful connection, if you've got the data to understand that. How do they do that? How do they build relationships using data? Well, the first thing in any relationship, it's a relationship is personal by definition. If you don't give up part of yourself, you're not going to get back. So it's personal by definition and you address that first step by understanding people's needs, wants and desires. That's what you're servicing. But how do you know that if they're not in the same room, if they're on the other side of the world on a mobile screen? Well, the data will tell you. So that's what Google was really successful at doing, is understanding why people are coming to ask questions and what, how can I give them a personalized answer, something that's relevant to them. Because when you search tiger, it can mean a lot of things. They build experiences. Think of Google Maps, getting from A to B with technology, with Google. It's Google that gets you there. It's an experience. What this experience part is, in order to be able to develop an experience, you need someone's attention. So experiences, it's about earning people's attention. Remember what I said with Gary Vaynerchuk? Attention is the asset now. When you have someone's attention, you have the ability to modify or manipulate or change or their reality, just like a magician. A magician will capture your attention, keep you busy with this while he's doing something over here and you won't see it because he's got your attention. So he controls your reality in that moment. They empower you. So technology is all empowering. Most of these apps that you're installing are solving a problem, helping you save time in most cases, helping you access information, helping you connect with each other, 
they're driving value. So values are very subjective things. You know, what, what do I hold valuable? It's very different than what you might hold valuable. So this is more about managing expectations. What expectation does my customer have? What value do they expect from me? Is it monetary? Is it time? Is it security? Is it, is it, is it, it can be so many things. Trust, loyalty, what do they want from me? What do they expect? It's about managing those expectations. One of the ways you can do it one was the ways Amazon does it. It's about customer delight, customer happiness. Zappos did it. Zappos was one of the first companies that sold shoes online. And they under-promised and over-delivered on everything. That's how to build happiness. You tell someone, oh, this is what you expect. This is the relationship I need to maintain. Here you go. And you do that and people are delighted and they'll come back for more. I say give people what they want and they'll come back for more. It's a simple rule. Okay, I'll move on a little bit. Uh, how are we going for time? Five minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so in the last section now, we're sort of coming down to the runway. Um, so, you see, Mark Zuckerberg, he, they, Facebook had a tough year last year. They had a really tough year. They reached the two billion mark. Um, Facebook had to really change some things because Facebook was in the business of connecting people. And when you're responsible for the connections, that's a big responsibility to have in a connected world. So they moved away from that. They changed their mission from make the world more open and connected to bringing the world closer together. That puts the responsibility of the connections to the community. They're not responsible for how you connect now. They'll provide the infrastructure for you to connect, but it is your decision and your responsibility who you connect with. Big, big shift from Facebook. And that's why it's not meaningful connections, but meaningful social interactions. You interact, but you choose the connections that you make. And it's all about building community. They brought the word community into their mission vision. This is a, that was a shortened version of, of, of uh, their mission statement. This was uh, for his manifesto, building community. It's all about supporting each other. It's about creating a safe environment. It's about being informed. It's about civic engagement. And it's about diversity and inclusion. This is what the manifesto is about. It's worth the read. Pretty, pretty incredible. And, and they've told us what they're going to do. Firstly, it's build Facebook. Step one. I'm not going to talk about underpants. No, no, let, let it go. Um, first, first step is Facebook. Second step is actually building the products that are going to capture people's attention. It's an attention economy. So they keep buying these things up and now we're spending most of our time on Facebook products. They were pretty successful at that. And then it's all about connecting people. This was before their new mission vision. It's all about artificial intelligence, getting more out of data, making things more personal and about VR, AR. Look at what they've done to Snapchat, you know, by just taking all of their features into Instagram. It was devastating for Snapchat. And Oculus, you know, the next version, if you have a chance of trying Oculus, it's amazing. But look at what's happened in the meantime. Four of the five biggest social platforms on the planet outside of China are owned by Facebook. They've passed the two billion on Facebook, they own WhatsApp, they own Facebook Messenger, they own Instagram, Tencent is also a mammoth, and they own WeChat and QQ, which are social platforms in China. And then you've got Google up there with their YouTube. Lucky they bought YouTube, huh? If they hadn't bought YouTube, it'd be over. Because YouTube's the second biggest search engine now. And we're all consuming video. Good decision. Okay, the recent developments in Facebook. So I'm gonna go really quickly over this so we can get to the, one of the last slides. So in February, he launches his manifesto about building global community. In June, they pass the two billion mark. They come in two days later with an updated set of values and promising us to their commitment to fix the feed. And then all the stuff comes in from the Russian election, from the Russian involvement in the elections, the fake news. And in December, all of the academic work they've been doing for the last few years comes in, the negative effects of social media. And then in January, well, Mark Zuckerberg comes out with this New Year's resolution to fix Facebook. Uh, a few days later, he comes out with a post about time well spent that when you go to Facebook, you should leave Facebook feeling fulfilled, feeling happy, feeling like the time that you spent there was time well spent. It brought you value. Trustworthiness, it's only three days ago. They want the community to rate what's, what sources are trustworthy. Big debate, lots of criticism around this because do we really know what we want? And the hard questions, is social media good or bad for democracy? 
came out two days ago. Go and read it. It's all, on, it's all over the place. It's on the Facebook blog. So the things that are going to change with the Facebook feed. So one thing you've got to realize, it's now going to be what you're going to see on your feed. Well, this is coming from what they're saying. We still need to see the proof. It's going to be more friends and family because those are the meaningful connections we seek in our lives. Friends, family, community. It's going to be more about communities because Facebook is all about the old communities. The trustworthiness, so trying to empower the community to tell Facebook what is trustworthy or not, what's a good source or not. Baiting, baiting is going to be a big one because it's a default part of most marketing campaigns. Clickbait, engagement bait, call to actions, trying to manipulate people into interacting with the ad because as soon as you've got an interaction, you've got a behavior and the algorithm picks up on that and if there's enough of it, it'll get amplified and off it goes. So you've got to be really, really careful with how you bait people into interacting. It needs to be organic. It needs to be native. It needs to make sense. Conversations. Hey, that's what really is the fabric of society, communication and conversations. And, um, and they bought all the messengers. So that's Facebook's next frontier, how to incorporate chat. And when you're talking about chat, you're talking about bots, you're talking about chat bots, you're talking about companies coming in and trying to now not interrupt people, but facilitate tasks in times of need. That's what it's all about. And video, one of the big ones. You know, we promote a lot of video on these platforms. Video is deemed now to be, you know, not very productive. You know, you spend hours watching these things and if you leave, think having felt that you've wasted time. And so your videos need to be more engaging, need to bring value to the user. That's going to be one of the things of this year. So one question you need to ask yourself is, do I create content that inspires authentic engagement and conversation? That's the core question. Whether it be paid or organic or community driven, you always got to ask yourself this question. I'm coming out with a blog in the next few days. It'll be published, so if you, I don't know, follow me on LinkedIn or something, you'll, you'll see something pop up. I'm also on Twitter, so you can see something. I'll, I'll share it for a few days at least, because the feeds are going ever so quickly now. Okay, so as we, as we end this, you gotta remember, you know, it all starts magical. Steve Jobs stepping up on stage, announcing his wonderful new devices, and we all want one. And then it goes to manic. It's pinging us from every which direction, taking our attention, taking our time away from the important things in life. And then it becomes toxic. It's when we're sitting around the dinner table, all staring at our screens, or when the machines have automated us out of a job. Technology is wonderful, but use it wisely. So the future belongs to those who hear it coming, but it's owned briefly by those who build it. Thank you.